We are uh, excited about what uh, begins now. Uh, we haven't done this for three years, and uh, we've been kind of doing what a lot of folks are doing, just kind of seeing what transpires with uh, audiences and attendance and those kind of things, and we wanted to bring our lectureship back this year, and we're certainly glad that we're able to do that, and we're glad that you have joined us this morning. We have four men who are going to be with us. Three are going to be speaking to us over the next three days, and Todd, as he did yesterday, is going to lead our singing, and so we look forward to that. Bill Sanchez is here, Ralph Walker is here, and Bill Hall is here, and these three men will be speaking for us, as I said uh, in the morning, we'll have two sessions in the morning and one at night. And this morning we're going to begin, Bill's going to, Bill Sanchez. I don't know how I'm going to distinguish between the Bills. I thought about saying one's handsome and one's not so handsome, but Bill Hall would be the handsome one, so I don't know where that puts you, <laughs> Bill. But uh, anyway, but uh, we're glad that, that all these men are with us. And Todd, in, in each session, before each speaker, Todd's going to lead one song. He's going to do that this morning. We'll also have some prayers, obviously, to ask God's blessings on us. But again, we look forward to that. So uh, in a moment, Ed Brand's going to come and lead us in a prayer. Then Todd's going to lead a song. And then Bill Sanchez will speak to us. And after Bill finishes, we'll take a break and then uh, have another song. And then um, Ralph will speak to us. And then after that, we'll have one more closing song and prayer. And then we'll be finished for the morning session. That's kind of how it's going to go Monday through Wednesday. So... Again, thank you for being here. We look forward to our time together. Ed, would you come please and lead us into prayer? Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks today for the rest of the night where our bodies were refreshed. And we're thankful that we can be in this place where we can assemble this morning and get refreshment for our spirits. We're so grateful for the Holy Spirit's work and revelation that we have access to it in the written word and we're thankful that these men have come to instruct us in the things that relate to eternity and to life here. We ask your blessings upon these men as they deliver their messages today that they may be men of the book and help us as listeners that we may listen carefully and attentively and make those changes in life which are required by your word in order to please you well. We're thankful that we can sing together, that we can lift our voices to praise you and to teach and admonish each other. And we're thankful for the provisions this church has made for this session and sessions to follow. We ask your blessings upon the teaching of your word today. Please help us to serve you well today. Bless those who could not be here because of illness Bless our brethren everywhere. We realize that there's unrest in this world, and we pray that peace can come soon. Please be merciful and forgive us of our sins of the blood of Jesus. We're so grateful that he died so that we can live. And we ask you to please help us that we might be conscious of who we are, and we can act accordingly. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I remember who's more handsome or not. And I hate to put myself in that situation. Uh, get up. It's a blessing to be with you all. I told Kenny I hate pulpits. Uh, if I can be down, I'd much rather that. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces. There's some faces I don't remember. So if I don't remember your name, please excuse me. But just introduce yourself again, and that'd be great. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to the book of Jonah. Uh, Jonah is the first text we're going to read that you'll, that at least I won't have the, the text up on the screen. Uh, so I told Kenny originally, uh, when he asked for some titles, that, uh, so I gave him three titles, and, and I kind of labeled it as Hard Lessons for Hard Times. And I guess that didn't work because he called it Hope and Trials. And so uh, we're going to try to make him hopeful, but there are also going to be some hard lessons. I'm just being transparent with you all. That some of the things, I, at least from my, uh, on my, from my kind of lessons, from, from my vantage point, some of the things I'm looking to talk about are hopefully things that challenge us, things that challenge prepping them and thinking about these things that have challenged me, that have been hard for me to think through. Um, that, that I hope would do the same for you because if you think about the world that we live in, I want to put some verses up for you. And as we read through these verses, I just want you to ask yourself, does this sound like the world that I live in today? So in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, in verses 5 through 7, the, Ecclesiastes, the preacher says, There is an evil I have seen under the sun like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. Do you see the picture that you get there in Ecclesiastes chapter 10? The preacher is saying, I look at the world around me and what's happening is that places where the people in charge, the people in charge are fools. And the people that I know, the people that actually have wisdom, the people who probably should be in charge, they're like slaves, they're nobodies. Do you sometimes feel like that? That as you look at the world around you, and you look at people in exalted places, that the people in exalted places, you think to yourself, they have no business being there. And maybe people, and maybe even people in this room, people that you really respect and you really admire, that in the eyes of the world, they're like slaves, they're nobodies. Or maybe that one doesn't work for you. Uh, what about this one here? Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and in verse 14, the writer says, There is a futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. Does this at all sound familiar to the world you live in? Maybe to make it a little more normal for us, this phrase a little more. Like, what good things happen to bad people? Why do the wicked prosper? Do you kind of sometimes, as you look at the world around you, is that something that goes on in your mind? That you look around and you're like, I'm trying to live a righteous life, and for whatever reason, I feel like I'm the one suffering, and there are people who are living wicked lives, and they're just getting away with it. And that's not right. At least it doesn't seem right. How am I supposed to think through, the, through all sorts of things? Well, what about this one here? In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and in verse 15, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and a wicked man who prolongs his life in wickedness. Does that describe the world that you live in? There are people who you think to yourself, this person doesn't deserve all the things that they have. And yet they still have all these things. And good people, they just die. What about this one in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 8? If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. You see the point that he's saying here. If you see bad things happening in the world, don't be surprised that bad things are happening. Here's why. For one official watches over another official, and the higher officials over, over, the, uh, excuse me, over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is, the, is an advantage to the land. Again, do you see the picture there? He says, don't be surprised if you see people who are being mistreated, if you see, if you see injustices happening, because you know what? You know all officials are doing is officials are watching over other officials. What about this one here? In chapter 3 and verse 16 and going into chapter 4. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness. And in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. Chapter 4 verse 1. Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which are being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears 
of the oppressed and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are dead more than the living who are still living. If you think about the world uh, that we live in, it's pretty hard to live life and not think about people who are being oppressed. Whether that's here, in some other place, like oppression happens. And do you know what the writer actually says? He says, you know, you know who's hurting, by the way, in these verses? Everybody is. The oppressed, the oppressed, they're hurting. Clearly, they're being oppressed. Bad things are happening, and so it's hurting them. But he says, if you actually look at the oppressors, the oppressors are hurting too. There's clearly something going on in them that's making them oppress other people. So he says, like, in these verses, again, they, the, 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 the oppressors, they had power, but they still have no one to comfort them. Maybe uh, the most concise way to think about all of this is what he says in chapter 1 and in verse 15. He says, what is crooked cannot be straightened. And what is lacking cannot be counted. Do you think about the world and how bent it is or how crooked it is? Do you think about the world and it kind of feels like you're doing a puzzle but you're missing pieces? And there's the frustration of what's the point of doing this? How do Christians think through things like that? How do we work through those things? Because as long, and I think one of the points in verse 15 is that as long as people have free will, which if, you know, God is going to be God, people are going to have free will. As long as people have free will, these things will always exist under the sun. There will always be crookedness under the sun. Things will always be missing under the sun. Injustices that we read about, injustices that we see on TV, injustices that you hear about on the news, they're always going to happen. Like nothing is going to change those things. New laws will not change those things. New people in power will not change those things. Injustices are going to happen because people are wicked and people are corrupt. So how do Christians work through those things? How do you maneuver the thought of children dying? How do you work through that? Or wars happening and people being treated unjustly? And they haven't done anything. Or people being treated unjustly because of the color of their skin or because of their social status or because of the money that they make or whatever it is. How do we work through those injustices? There's a temptation. Um, when we work, as we think about all the injustices and we think about God's righteousness, and I think especially in a room like this where people get together and they want to listen to God's word because they want to do what's right, there's a temptation to think we're seeking justice and what we're actually seeking is revenge. I think the book of Jonah uh, bears that out for us and so what I want us to do is spend a little bit of time looking in the book of Jonah at, at just this image of how do we work through some of those things and then just kind of to know where we're going to go. We're going to look at Jonah and then we're going to look at Jesus and think through how do we work through injustices. How does Jonah do it uh, and what are some lessons we need to learn from Jonah? And then what are some lessons we need to learn from our Lord? And then I'm going to leave you with some questions I'd like for you to think about. But again, injustices exist and they are always going to exist. And what you, what you notice if, if you've read the book of Jonah is that, again, the, in, in the book of Jonah, Jonah, this, God, God will send him to go out and preach to a group of people. And in his mind, not even in his mind, in the world that Jonah is living in, Jonah hates the people that God is telling him to go preach to. And with reason. Because God is sending him to the Ninevites. And, the, and Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. And the Assyrians, they're the world power. And the Assyrians, they don't care for the Israelites. So why should Jonah care about them? In fact, if you, you kind of read the story of the Bible, later on, Assyria, they will come and they will conquer northern Israel. Why in the world would I go preach to those people? Why in the world would I try to help them? And I think the book of Jonah is interesting, especially when you consider the prophets. Jonah is distinct in that I think the recipient of God's message in the book of Jonah is not the Ninevites. I think the person who really needs to hear the lesson in the book of Jonah is Jonah. The Ninevites, the message they hear is six words long and they repent. All of chapter 4 is a conversation that God is having with Jonah, trying to help Jonah. 
And so the, the, the hero in the story, the protagonist, really God is. But as you read Jonah, you might think it's Jonah. It's not. Jonah's the antagonist all the way through. And so my hope is, again, as we go through this lesson, is that if we're harboring, if we're harboring feelings of resentment or, or, or vengeance or wrath or whatever it is on people who have committed injustices, people who we think they are not worthy of God, they are not worthy of God's grace, my hope is, is that as we read through the story of Jonah, and here's some of the things our Lord has to say. That it would challenge us and prick us and make us work through some of these things. So again, uh, the, it, the question I want us to ask ourselves as we go through this lesson is, am I seeking revenge or justice? When injustices happen, when bad things happen, and, and I think there's a sense where all of us, we, we should be emotionally stirred. Bad things happen and you know bad things should not happen. What is it that I want in those moments? So again, just kind of a quick crash course on the book of Jonah here. So Jonah, the, the book opens up and it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And so real quick, the book begins, and God instructs Jonah to go to Nineveh and to preach against them. And we already said some things about kind of where Nineveh is, who Nineveh is. Nineveh would have been kind of to the northeast. Also, I just feel like I need to say this every time. If I'm talking too fast do something give me some sort of hand or something to let me know that I'm talking too fast because I'll get going and then I'll forget the speed that I'm talking at so uh, if I'm talking in another language also let me let me know as well uh, but yeah, so so Nineveh would have been to the northeast and so God says arise go to that city and if you notice, in, in the first few verses, God doesn't deny that Nineveh's wicked. In fact, Nineveh's so wicked, God says, if something doesn't change, they're going to have to be destroyed. And so it's not like from God's vantage point, God is saying, Nineveh, I mean, that's a really nice city of really nice people. You should go there and just spend some time there because everything is cool. He says, no, you need to go there because they're wicked. You need to go there because they need to hear the word of the Lord. And if you don't, they're going to be destroyed. And so this is kind of like the premise, this is how the book opens up. This is the setting of the book. And so then notice, you know, Jonah, he's a prophet of God, so obviously he is going to listen to what God has to say. He's going to go, you know, because that's what prophets do. That's what Christians do, right? God tells you to do things, and he tells you to do things that you don't like, and he tells you to love your enemies, and you're going to do those things, because that's who you are. Except in verse 3, as the text continues, notice, notice Jonah's response here. It reads and it says, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found the ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of God. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea. So the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below in the hold of the ship, laying down, and had fallen sound asleep. I think when you read verses 3 through 5, I think again, the book of Jonah is trying to help us understand, first of all, how much Jonah dislikes these people and all the lengths he is willing to go to make sure that they do not hear the word of the Lord. It's not like Jonah says, I'm going to reject God's word and just stay home. Jonah decides, I'm going to flee as far as possible. And so if, 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 uh, if Nineveh would have been, I don't actually know the, the geographic, whatever things, if Nineveh, but if Nineveh would have been about 500 miles northeast, Tarshish would have been 2,000 southwest. He is going as far away possible from this. But do you notice actually where it leads him from? First of all, Jonah's got a few things he doesn't realize. He thinks that God is some localized God. God isn't bound to Israel. In fact, God knows what's happening in Nineveh. Jonah should have seen that, but he's not thinking clearly. And then Jonah actually tries to flee from the presence of God, because that's what ends up happening, is that whenever we are led by our wrath, whenever we're led by vengeance, and, and we think, these people don't deserve God's mercy, so I'm not going to talk to them about God. Where it actually leads you is it leads you away from God's presence. That's where Jonah's trying to go. And do you notice how everything kind of plays out perfectly for Jonah to do this? So he goes to Tarshish, and in Tarshish, he just happens to find a ship. Sorry, he goes to Joppa, and while he's in Joppa, he happens to find a ship that's going to Tarshish. Well, this is great. And he happens to have the money to pay for this trip. This is great. I mean, everything is just lining up for him to not do what God wants him to do. Which, by the way, Satan, I think, is very content with making things line up in your life so that you don't have to do what God wants us to do. You can't blame your circumstances for you not being the person that God wants you to be. 
You can't blame the, 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 the injustices, the things, well, this and that. And God, well, if God didn't want me to do these things, then all these things wouldn't have played out. In the story, everything is playing out for Jonah to not have to do what God is wanting him to do. And he's in this boat, and this, God hurls the storm. Even in the text, by the way, uh, I think it's phenomenal that, that the sailors, I mean, you just look through in, in the book of Jonah, everybody seems godly except for Jonah. The sailors, they're crying out to their gods. Jonah's just asleep. Jonah does not care what happens here. This is his response here. And so eventually in the conversation, the sailors, I mean, Jonah says, look, this is happening. They wake him up and he's like, this is happening because of my God. He's angry. I'm not obeying him. You have to throw me over. And to them, Jonah's a foreigner. Jonah's the reason they're suffering. And even then they're like, no, 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 let's try to find something else. So they're trying to lighten the boat even more. And Jonah's like, you have to throw me over. So they throw Jonah over in chapter two, God, you know, at the end of chapter one, he gets saved by the, by the, the fish in chapter two. There's this prayer that Jonah say, uh, Jonah prays. And then chapter three, in chapter three, God instructs Jonah again to go to Nineveh and to preach against them, which is interesting. Like God saved Jonah. And so the message wasn't going to be any different. I just like, I want to say that up front now that if, if at the end of this lesson, you're like, you know what? I've been Jonah and I've been behaving like this and I need to change and I need to repent. So you repent. After you repent, the expectations that God had are the same expectations he had at the very beginning. In chapter one, he says, go to Nineveh, preach against them. In chapter three, he says, go to Nineveh, preach against them. Jonah breaks up chapters one and two, chapters three and four, kind of in, as, as kind of mirror chapters of one another. Um, but he says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah obeys the word of the Lord, and like how excited is he about this? I don't know if the idea is he just went one day and then left, or he walked for one day and then started to begin. I think, but it's regardless, do you notice the sermon he's preaching? Think about all the minor prophets and all the lessons and sermons in the Bible. Jonah's preaching a six-word sermon. 40 days and God's going to throw you guys over. At least what the text indicates, there is no this is how you repent. There is no this is what God wants from you. It's just yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. And then you know what Jonah does? He leaves the city. And he doesn't leave the city and goes home. He leaves the city and goes east of the city. Which by the way, uh, well I won't, I won't make those points now. But uh, He leaves the city and goes east of the city. And he's just sitting watching. And I just imagine, right? Jonah's watching. And it's day 39. And he's just looking. And it's day 40. And he's probably looking up at the sky and nothing's happening. And he's like, ah, surely I thought God was going to destroy them. And notice Jonah's response to everything that happens. Hopefully you have your Bibles there in, in the book of Jonah. Let's go to Jonah chapter 4. Let's read the whole chapter. I'll put some of the verses up here, but I do want us to read the whole chapter. It's only 11 verses. I know when you hear the whole chapter, it makes it sound a lot more daunting than it is. Uh, Jonah chapter 4. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, Do you have good reason to be angry? And Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord appointed a planet, grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when the dawn came up the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun began to beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die saying, death is better to me than life. And God says to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work. 
and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Do you notice Jonah's response here as God is talking to him? So Jonah, he's, he goes outside of the city and he's upset. And in this prayer, he says, God, I'm so mad that you are you. Which is a bit ironic because if God wasn't God, Jonah would have been gone a whole long ago, a whole long time ago. If it's me, if I am God, in chapter 1, when I send Jonah out and Jonah doesn't go, you're not, you're not getting to Joppa, Jonah. You're dead. Or when you're in the boat, I'm not sending a fish to save you. You're going to drown. Or even afterwards, like, you're going to complain. So many times. And Jonah's like, I'm so mad that you're a compassionate and merciful God. Which, by the way, Jonah needs to be glad that that's who God is. Because that's who Jonah needs right now. But Jonah doesn't see it. And he's so upset. He's so upset that God saved people. That his response is, death is better to me than life. I want you to think about the person who has hurt you most right now. Whatever that is. How would you feel about them being in this building trying to learn about God right now? Would you be okay with that? Because if there's any feelings of bitterness or wrath or they don't deserve to be them, I don't want them here. Whatever it is. And whatever they've done, you might be Jonah. And so God says, do you have a good reason to be angry? And do you notice Jonah doesn't have a response? Because I, I think Jonah knows he has no reason to be angry. So he just leaves. Again, second time he departs from God's prayer, tries to leave God. He leaves in verse 5 because he doesn't have a good reason. He sits east and he's trying to see what's going to happen to the city. And God appoints in the same way that he appointed uh, the fish to deliver him. He appoints the plant to deliver him. I think it's the same imagery there. Um, but he appoints this plant and it grew up over him to deliver him from his discomfort. And again, the plant withers and Jonah's discomfort is a bigger deal to him than people dying. So when you think about Jonah, um, I think one of the lessons that Jonah fails to see, and this is a really, really, really long introduction. This is the title slide. One of the lessons that Jonah fails to see is that in times of injustices, God isn't just looking to dole out wrath. He wants to give grace and mercy as well. And I think that, at least in my life, uh, when I think about ways that I've been hurt, or even more ways than I've been hurt, when I look at and I think about ways in which other people have been hurt, especially innocent people, ways in which they have been hurt, the first thing I want is for the Lord to come. Because I want those people to be punished. And one of the lessons I think we learn in the book of Jonah is that God wants to save those people. That part of the reason why the Lord is being patient is because his first thought isn't, I'm just going to destroy everybody, is will those people come to a repentance and to a knowledge of the truth? And so I want us to think really quickly, in Jonah's quest for, 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 for vengeance, because he's not thinking about justice, it's blinding him to some things. I want us to just think really quickly through some things that Jonah's quest for revenge is blinding him to. I think the first thing it blinds him to is how his actions are negatively affecting everybody around him. Do you notice, as the book goes on, Jonah's like the taboo character. Everywhere Jonah goes, bad things happen. But not because of the people around him. It's happening because of him. He gets mad, so he flees from God, right? And so he goes to Joppa. He gets in this boat to go to Tarshish. The storms come, and these sailors are going to lose their lives. They are, they are afraid. They think they're going to die. Whose fault is it? It's Jonah's fault. Because Jonah's there. The Ninevites, they were going to be destroyed. And now, obviously because of their wickedness, but also because Jonah was unwilling to go to them. Jonah would have played a part in that. But then even in chapter 4, the plant withers and it withers to teach Jonah a lesson. It's like everywhere Jonah goes, bad things are happening, but it's happening because of Jonah. And I think sometimes whenever we are so caught up in revenge, so caught up in people deserve to be destroyed, and we have like, that's the heart that we're harboring, that bitterness, that wrath, that slander. We don't see how we're negatively affecting everybody around us. You think your kids don't see that? You think your neighbors don't see that? You think your coworkers don't see that? That whenever you, you're harboring this wrath and this wickedness, and I hate them, and that's kind of the way that we're talking. You think the world doesn't see that? How are you affecting them? 
Again, Jonah's blinded to how his actions are affecting everybody around him. And I think one of the, another thing you see in the text is that Jonah, he doesn't see how similar he is to his enemies. Think about it in the book. Jonah thinks the Ninevites should be destroyed because they're the wicked people. But it's in the book of Jonah, Jonah's the person who does not obey, who does not listen to the word of the Lord. Jonah's the person who flees from the word of the Lord. Jonah's the person who at the end of the book, when God is trying to get Jonah, I think, to repent, Jonah's just sitting, soaking, upset. And Jonah sees the Ninevites as the them. Jonah is the them. Jonah's become the enemy of God in the book. Like, that's, that's who Jonah is in this book. And I think it's easy for us to see the wickedness that other people do. It's easy for me, excuse me, to see the wickedness that other people do and see that's the them. And for me to fail to see how much like them I am. That I've hurt people too. Maybe not in the same scale, but I've definitely hurt. And it, it, notice how I talk. I'm justifying it to myself. Maybe not in the same scale. Because in my mind, I didn't do it as bad. But maybe you should go ask them. Ask them how they feel. Ask the people I've hurt how it's, how it's affected them. But that's how we think. I haven't done it in the same ways. Jonah was far more like them than he realized. But he was blinded to it. I think, again, Jonah has been blind to how merciful God has been to him the entire time. Throughout the whole book, God has been merciful to Jonah. God is giving Jonah extra opportunities. He's giving Jonah extra chances. I think about how often I get so indignant to the world that I forget all the opportunities God should have been indignant towards me. You know what I mean? Think about how many times God has been merciful to you. How many times you've prayed for forgiveness. You didn't deserve that. You were asking for mercy. God has been patient towards you. Shouldn't he be the same towards your enemies? Towards the people who've hurt you? Towards the people who are hurting other people? And I think a fourth thing it's blinding Jonah to see. Is, it's blinding Jonah to see the innocent people that God wanted to save. Because when we get so caught up in re revenge and vengeance and wrath, we're not even thinking clearly about the people we could be saving. Because you're so caught up in the people who should be destroyed, you don't think about the people who need God. So what are some lessons from Jonah that we need to learn? I think maybe the first lesson we need to learn is that Jonah needed to understand the justice and mercy of God. Because in Jonah's mind, what God's justice and mercy meant is God's justice towards them and his mercy towards me. Jonah thought that like Jonah was the center of the universe and God, God worked for him and not for the other people. That's not the way justice and mercy works. God is the sun. Kind of to think like we were talking about the sun and the earth and with the boys earlier today. God is the sun of the universe. Everything revolves around him. So God will dole out, he'll give justice as he deems fit. And God will be merciful on who he deems fit. Not on the people that I like, not on the people that look like me, not on the people who believe what I believe, not on the people who... I don't determine who God needs to be wrathful towards and who God needs to be merciful towards. God does. I think Jonah needed to learn that lesson. Here's a second lesson I think that Jonah needed to learn. Is that Jonah needed to learn that God wanted to save Jonah from himself more than in circumstances. Think about the greater salvation that God was trying to give Jonah. It wasn't from the Ninevites. It wasn't from the fish. Because who was Jonah's enemy really in the book? Who, was what, who or what was the thing keeping Jonah from God? It was Jonah. The Ninevites, they weren't stopping Jonah from worshiping God. The pagan sailors who were worshiping other gods, they weren't stopping Jonah from serving God. It was Jonah all along. I mentioned the score, like the plant that God sent to deliver Jonah. And I think, again, the plant is supposed to serve as a purpose to kind of lead that conversation forward so that God could tell him, Jonah, you're not seeing clearly because with, you think that God saved, like we, we talk a lot about God saving Jonah in chapter 2, from, like with the fish. And we don't talk enough about the plant in chapter 4. Because again, God wasn't just looking to save Jonah's life or his circumstance. Jonah's soul needed to be saved. And oftentimes, whenever we want justice or whenever we want revenge or wrath or whatever, it's because my life here isn't the way that it should be or my circumstances aren't right. Even if God doesn't save you from that, so what? There's something greater that you need saving from. And honestly, I'm just speaking for myself. I would rather God save me from, from bitterness and God save me from wrath and God save me from hatred than he save me from my enemies. 
Because my enemies can't send me to hell, but those things can. And so Jonah needed to see that. A third lesson is that Jonah needed to learn again that God didn't want to just save him. He wanted to save everyone. Like, I believe in 2 Peter chapter 3 when God says, when Peter writes, excuse me, and says that God is wanting all men to repent, that God is patient. God hasn't come back because he's waiting for people to, like, he wants to save people. I, I take that as truth. Which what that means is, is that God wants people in prison to repent just as much as he wants people, people in this building to repent. That God wants the people who have hurt you to repent and to be saved and to be in heaven just as much as your family and the people you love the most. That you might not see it that way, but God does. Because everybody here has been created in God's image. Here's a fourth lesson I think Jonah uh, needed to learn. And maybe one of the biggest lessons is that part of being saved means becoming like God. And that means extending grace to those people who have hurt you. That if we're going to say we're God's people, and we're going to say we're his image bearers, what that means is that we extend grace and mercy to people who have hurt you, just like God did it to you after you had hurt him. Because when you think about maybe, maybe to better help us think through this a little bit more clearly, um, maybe let's just flip the question. When you have hurt people, what did you want? Did you want like full justice and wrath to come down on you? You're like, no, 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 just, I mean, I know me, that's not really who I am. Just like, be a little lenient towards me. In our times of failure, we never want revenge, and we even seldom want justice. What we really want is mercy. At least, I can't, again, I can't speak for you all, but in my life, when I have messed up, when I have hurt people, when I have done things that, have, that I know have hurt God for sure and have hurt other people, what I have always wanted has been mercy and grace. It's never been revenge for sure, and it really hasn't even really been justice. And so if I want to receive these things, what does God expect of me? Four quick points here, um, and then I'll leave you with some questions and we'll be done. In Matthew chapter 5, you go to Matthew chapter 5 here. Now, I want to look at some things that Jesus says about mercy, about receiving mercy, and if you're going to receive mercy, what this means for you. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus sees the crowds, and he sees a crowd of people uh, who, and th these would have been people who would have been, he'd been healing recently, people who been, been, have been hearing him talk about the kingdom. Jesus sees the crowd in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 1. And he sits down, and his disciples come to him, and he opens his mouth. And he begins to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he continues, and he says, Blessed are, the, are, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What are some lessons we need to learn about giving mercy and receiving mercy? The first lesson we need to learn is we need to remember who we are. You need to remember your identity. That you behave according to how you view yourself. You know that, right? Everybody does. However it is that you view yourself, that's how you behave. If we could view ourselves more as these sorts of people, people who are poor in spirit, People who've had to mourn over their own sins. If you could view yourself more as someone who has received mercy, do you think that it would help you extend a little more grace and mercy towards other people? And so whenever we're not doing that, you have to ask yourself the opposite question. What about my image is causing me to behave like this? Because you are not an American first and a Christian second. 
You are not an Alabamian, however you would say that, first and a Christian second. You are not a Republican or a Democrat first and a Christian second. And whenever you view your life through those scopes, you're missing out on the actual point. And so you're never going to treat people appropriately because you are a Christian first. And I would venture to say all those other things aren't even second. You are a Christian, period. But if you wanted to put a second, I mean the totem pole is so far down, you can't see it. But you'd be that thing second. So behave according to your identity. God has been merciful towards you. And he expects you to be merciful towards other people. This is not the only time he says it in the sermon, by the way. Chapter 6, he'll repeat the same thing after praying. Here's a second lesson, I think, for us. In Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 12, Jesus will say towards the end of this sermon, actually, let's go to verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. What man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he, not, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, Treat people the same way that you would want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12, I think one of the challenges that Jesus is giving us is that, like, let me just kind of put this out there. If you do not believe in God, you will always have a jaded image of justice, and you don't see yourself according to how God sees you. And what Jesus will say is you need to treat people the way that you would want them to treat you, but maybe let me challenge you a little bit more. Because the way that you would want to be treated, I think in verses 7 through 11, Jesus actually says, this is how everybody wants to be treated. That when you ask, that when you're seeking, that when you're knocking, that you're finding things. That when you ask for a bread, God, notice he doesn't say, you're, like, when you ask for bread, God, your Father, he knows what to give you. So maybe the challenge is, isn't just treat people the way that you would want them to treat you, because sometimes we're a little cynical, you know? And we're like, hey, well, I, if I did those things, I'd want you to treat me like that, which isn't true, you're lying to yourself. But we might be tempted to say those things. We say treat people the way God has treated you. That's the golden rule. How has, what has God done towards you? Treat people like that. Here's the third idea here. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, sorry, excuse me, in Matthew chapter 18, we won't read these verses, but in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is given a parable about these two servants. And there was one servant who owed his master, and he owed his master an insurmountable, like the debt was insurmountable. He was never going to be able to pay it off, and the master forgives him. And then you read the story, and there's another servant who owes him far less than he owed the master. And he's like, you're going to pay me everything you owe me. And the master hears about it. And he gets upset, and he throws him in jail. You know what the point of that story is, as he's talking about forgiveness in that chapter? You know what the point of that story is? Is that you have hurt God far more than anybody has ever hurt you. You want to be better? Like these are just kind of some tips on giving grace and giving mercy. I have never hurt, sorry, no one has ever hurt me nearly as bad as I have hurt God. Because everything that I have done that has been wicked has always been towards God. Everything. And God, by the way, is just and perfect and righteous. And so it's not like I can sit here and say, well, God, well, you've done bad things to people too, so it, it doesn't. He's been perfect. He's holy. And so if God has forgiven me of what I've owed him, am I not responsible to forgive other people? Again, and then I just, it's hard to think through these lessons and think through people being unjust and not think about the most unjust time in human history, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. When our Lord and our Savior, the, a righteous, perfect, innocent man, was put to death. The hand of wicked men. And you know what he said as he died? You know what's the first thing that Luke records that he, he says as he dies? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then, I think about Stephen in Acts chapter 7. As he's dying, for talking about Jesus at the hand of wicked men. And he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
And maybe a fourth lesson for us is that what God's people ultimately desire is for the salvation of the same people who have oppressed them. That if I'm going to sit here and sing that I know that my Redeemer lives, He does not ever live and plead for me. He lives and pleads for everyone. That what He wants is the salvation of all souls. So here are some questions I want to leave you with as we think through some of these things. When you think about injustices, what's the actual battle you're looking to fight? Like who and what am I really fighting against? Am I fighting against a person? Because Ephesians 6 will say our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. People are not my enemy. The things that they do need to be corrected because they're under the power of the evil one, the prince of the power of the air. And that needs to change. But you need to think, we need to think clearly about who the enemy is. Because we get way too caught up seeing people as enemies when what people need is God. In some ways, they're just as much victims. They're victims of, of a power far more greater than themselves. They're victims of the devil. Here's a second question I'd like for you consider, to consider. Am I tempted to paint pictures over a certain group of people? And because I've painted a picture over a certain group of people, does that potentially affect the way that I view their justice deservedness? Or maybe their mercy deservedness? You get the point that I'm asking with this question here? Everybody has prejudices. Whether it's, again, over a political group, all these people are like this. Whenever you talk like that, something bad is happening. All these people. All those people? All these people are like this. All these people do this. All these people think that. And when we talk like that, you know what ends up happening is we paint a picture. We just take a brush and we just say, everybody's like this, so nobody deserves God. They all deserve wrath. By the way, I've intentionally been vague about who the enemy is, because everybody has different, my guess is if we poll everybody here, not everybody's going to have the same thing, same beliefs about every single thing, and who the enemy is. But if, if you are painting like broad pictures over a general group of people, that has got to change. Here's a third question I want you to consider. We know according to scripture that God uses the government and ultimately himself to be the dispensers of justice and wrath. And hopefully even when I think it's not happening all the ways in which it should happen, God will make all things right. But if, if I know for a fact the government, they're not going to dispense grace and mercy, at least not biblical grace and mercy. If I'm not doing it, then who's going to? If I decide I'm going to take the mantle for justice and wrath and vengeance, then who's dispensing God's grace? Like Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 3. Who's doing that if we're not doing it? By the way, I just want, I want to make one thing clear. I'm not advocating for like lack of consequences for injustices. That's a, that's a biblical concept that needs to happen. But I think sometimes if left up to our own devices, we, don't, we always go a little bit further than just consequences. We've got to be careful about that. Here's a fourth question. Um, maybe a trying question for me here. Is when is it that I'm seeking for justice? Like why this case and not this other case? Because let me just say, like, I think we live in a world that maybe today, maybe it's the way the media works now or the way the fact that it's like an oversaturation of information and so everybody knows about everything that's happening everywhere. Maybe that's making us more aware of injustices, but we read Ecclesiastes, injustices have always been happening. This is not new. I think, I think Sewell might be the oldest person here. You know, Sewell, if injustices were happening when he was my, they've always happened. Why do you now care about this issue? Is it because you can kind of see yourself in the shoes there? And so you're like, well, that could be me. Or that could be my kids. Or that could be this. Or that could be that. Because when you care for justice, you always care for justice. Regardless of when it's happening, to who it's happening, justice is justice. Righteousness is righteousness. Regardless of who it is, what they look like, where they're from, none of that matters. If you are just, you are just. You are not just just when you can see yourself in the person's shoes. 
And so if I'm picking and choosing when I want to be just or righteous or when an issue is going to bother me or not, according to scripture, then I may not be as righteous as I think I am. Here's the fifth question. What's informing my desire for justice? Is it my culture? Is it my race? Is it the media, politics, fill in the blank? Or is it the gospel? Because if the reason why we are getting riled up about the issue is because the media or some person is telling me to get riled up about it, that's a problem. Injustice has happened and we should be riled up. It should bother us. It should hurt us. But because God says they're wrong, not because the world says they're wrong. So again, these are questions we need to consider. Why, do, why are these things bothering me? Here's a sixth question. What am I doing? To help change the way that people view revenge and justice and mercy. Now I'm not sure how much time I've got, but I feel like I've gone well, well past time. So it is what it is at this point. Um, but here's the last question I want you to think about. Like, what is it that I actually want when I think about mercy and justice? Like, I want you to paint the actual picture of what you're looking for when you talk about justice and mercy and things being right. Have you ever seen that? Has that ever existed here? Is it possible that you're looking for something that can't be counted here? Is it possible that you're looking for straight in a crooked world? Is it possible that maybe that's why we need to seek something a little bit better? We talk about the hope aspect in this trial. That's the hope that God offers us is that there is a place that God is preparing for us where righteousness dwells, where things will be right, where there'll be no injustices, there'll be no need, no need for the tears of the oppressed, nor the tears of the oppressor, because everything will be right. And if that, if that is true, like the scriptures say that it's true, then that gives me hope to bear whatever oppressions I'm going through. It gives me hope to extend mercy and grace to the oppressors or the people who are causing injustices. I want to leave you all with a quote. Uh -huh. And I had the quote up. I didn't, well, it's Sewell's here, but it's a quote Sewell taught in some class some time ago. Uh, and he was, he was not talking about this particularly. He was talking through the book of Ephesians. But he made the point, and the, point is, the, the quote reads, and it says, we can be so quiet with our preaching and so indistinct in our conduct that people don't even notice it. When that's the case, there's not much progress, progress made as a rule. We don't seek to stir up strife in a position intentionally, but we do preach the truth aggressively and conduct ourselves distinctly. If we are what we ought to be, to be looked down on and to be viewed as troublemakers in this society where we are because of our distinctiveness, I wonder sometimes if our lack of growth it's not due to the fact that we've blended into the culture, sorry, it's not due to the fact that we've blended into the culture too clearly, too easily, we're not being seen as different. You want to be viewed as different in 2022? Be merciful and be gracious the way the gospel tells you to. Preach the gospel aggressively. You'll, you'll look different than everybody else because we live in a world that's always ready to dole out wrath for whatever the issue is, all the time, always. Be distinct. Don't blend into the culture. And may the Lord help us in this.
Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I just realized I have a clicker and uh, I don't know if it works while the song leader's there, but if the song's going slower than I want, I can just pop, 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 advance that baby. Or if I really like a verse, back it up. Let's do that one again. I like that. Yeah. I have power here. Power. Same way with the lesson. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, well, those guys have it, not you. Those guys, they can move the lesson along easily. I'm really glad to be with you. I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm just uh, floored by that last message. Um, I, don't, I had known Bill. I don't know him. By, we're newly acquainted. But my heart was pierced. Because I've, uh, I think I've imbibed too deeply of our political climate. And uh, I feel like I've been Jonah. I needed to hear that today. That was powerful. Powerful words from a man younger than me much younger than I am I'm I'm in the middle generation these two men Bill and Sewell Hall have <clears throat> long been heroes of mine long from the time I knew Sewell's son Gardner at Florida College I have followed and admired and listened to and learned from the Hall brothers and uh, I'm so anxious to hear what Bill has to share with us and to see Brother Sewell. That's a great blessing for me. And then I've got this younger brother on the other side of me that I haven't known that I'm so looking forward to hearing more from, although it hurts. But I'm sure looking forward to that. And I feel like, and you're going to misunderstand it, so I'm going to explain it. I feel like I'm the middle of an Oreo. And for those of you who love the cream in the middle, you'll go, wow, he's really putting himself in a really elevated position. But it's the exact opposite because I love the cookie outsides. I used to follow and I, had, I, I said amen to that old commercial. A kid will eat the middle of an Oreo first and save the chocolate cookie outsides for last. And I feel like I'm between uh, two presenters of the word 
that I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to hear. I'm as, um, I'm as blessed to be here to listen and maybe more, much more so than you are to hear me today. I'm richly blessed. Thank you for letting me be here. Thanks for the time together. I do feel like I've listened to the guy. I figured out what he needs to do, Bill, if he doesn't continue preaching, and I sure hope he does, but if he doesn't, he needs to be the guy who does those little tag-ons at the end of the radio commercials, you know, <laughs> about what the percentage rates and all that stuff is that they rush past you because they don't really want you to hear it. I have finger cramps because I took so many notes. I, my, my fingers won't open and my ears hurt. But I sure was, um, sure was blessed by that message. I, I did a series of lessons recently and was talking to Kenny about these. I, I rediscovered a little book that was written by James D. Bales in 1964. It was called The Case for Cornelius. A little, little tiny book. And I pulled it off my shelf because I wanted to look up one particular thing I had remembered from that book. And in that, I, I reread it and I said, this is powerful material. Um, and, and so as I was reading that, I kept thinking, boy, this is something my brethren need to hear. That, we need to talk about this and we need to re examine this. So I'm probably not going to tell you a lot that you haven't heard before. But I'm going to play Peter and remind you of things you have known in the past. And hopefully it'll be helpful to you. So in that series of five lessons that I've done so far, uh, Kenny said, I'd, these are good. We'd like you to consider doing these. So if you love these lessons, you tell Kenny. And if you don't love these lessons, you tell Kenny. Because these are lessons that uh, he asked if I would bring to you. And I, and I do think they're relevant for our culture and our time. So this morning, I want to talk about this idea of uh, needing a miracle. I was looking up online uh, from blues to rock to country to rap to pop and Broadway. Miracles have played a prominent role in music. Uh, I, I was just thought I would look at that and it is incredible how many songs talk about miracles and they talk about miracles largely in relation to love and romance but they also talk about miracles in terms of circumstances and things that are good in your life and things that you want to happen I found quick in a quick search nearly 600 song titles that contain that word Miracle in the song titles and thousands of songs use the word in the lyrics thousands So we have this idea or concept about miracles We we sing about them and we think they play a large part in our romantic relationships and in our lives and In that connection. We also think miracles are really important the, I say we the religious world in our faith and our relationship to God. I'm, I'm not sure that that's valid and that it is certainly overplayed in our culture. Miracles are romantic relationships. Lovers are miracles. Coincidences are miracles. Smokey Robinson sang with miracles. That was funny. You could laugh at that. Those of you who know Smokey Robinson and the miracles. And miracles play a major role in the Bible also. I mean a major role. But, and so because of that, we often hope for or expect or think that miracles are going to be true in our lives also. And the religious world talks about that almost incessantly. The nature of miracles. And one of the passages that is often used to talk about miracles is where we're going. And that is Acts chapter 10. It is where we're going to be in my lessons with you, Lord tarrying and allowing us to be together for this entire series. I'm going to be in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. This is the conversion story of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion who is uh, living in Caesarea and 
his life is such that God is drawn to him and grants him what he most desires. And it's not a miracle. We're going to look at that in detail in the next few minutes together. What Cornelius wants is to have a deeper, better relationship with God. And God grants that. But in the granting of that, there are several miracles that occur. And as a result of the miracles that occur here, people today sometimes talk about expecting similar miracles in our lives. So what I'm, I'm just telling you up front, what I'd like to do is examine the miracles that are here and see, is it valid that we could expect those kinds of things in our lives? And if not, then why are they there? Why did he get something we don't get? And what might we expect in our lives and in our relationship with God? That's where I want to go with you today. So in, in the beginning of chapter 10, it, it opens this way. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, called the Italian cohort. And, and then it says he was a devout man <clears throat> and he was one who feared God with all his household. We're going to talk much more about that tomorrow, Lord allowing. And he gave many alms to the Jewish people and he prayed to God continually. And now here comes the miracle. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers, and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now you dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He's staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. Pause here. Simon, Simon. We've got the same problem we got here, Bill and Bill. Uh, it's biblical. That's all the way back to Acts chapter 10. When the angel who was speaking to him had left... He summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, meanwhile, over in Joppa, we come to Simon. This is the other side of this story. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. I've been to the house that supposedly is the house of Simon the Tanner on the coast of um, the city where he was, Joppa. And there is a, there's a rooftop there. It's very convenient. It was very common to go up on the rooftop in the heat of the day where you could get the breezes coming in off the water. And so he has gone up there to pray. And it says he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. This is miracle number two. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals, crawling creatures of the earth, birds of the air, and a voice came to him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Now, I, I, have, I have to tell you, uh, that, that vision that he saw as he was in that trance was probably not as savory as you and I might think because this is filled with animals he's not used to eating. So if, if you're thinking, if you're thinking there's a pig and it's sitting in there down near the bottom because he's a heavier creature. He's down near the bottom of that big net and, and sticking out there. If you're thinking, bacon, 
you're thinking like an American who's used to eating a lot of that. Peter would have never had that in his mouth in his life. So rather than thinking about things that we love and would love to eat, oh, there's a lobster. Oh, man, get me some drawn butter. I'm into this. Rather than that, think in terms of, for us, it might be filled with the kinds of unsavory things for some of us, like slugs or snakes or possums or armadillos. Now, now some of us, I've eaten possum, I don't like it, it's greasy. And armadillo is just possum on the half shell. So those are not, those are not things that I'd, I'd say, oh boy, I'm salivating already. And that's the way Peter would have reacted to this. When he saw this, he is seeing things not that look enjoyable to him or palatable. He's not saying, oh, I'm already, I'm already salivating over this. His response to that statement is, Lord, by no means, I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. And then it says a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And then it says in verse 16, I want you to note, it says in verse 16, this happened three times. So uh, here's, here's what's happened. Peter's in a trance. He's hungry. That's significant. He is hungry. And down comes this netting from heaven, like a, a big, I think of it like the big cargo nets, like you see them load ships with. Big cargo net. And here it comes down, and there's a pig sticking his head out one side, and there's a lobster over on the other side, and there's some birds there that they're not allowed to eat, and all kinds of animals that are in this. It's massive. It's weighed with all that. And this voice says, arise, kill, eat, eat, eat. And he says, no, I don't do that, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean or unholy. Never. Never. And then the, the voice says, well, don't you call what God has made unclean or unholy. Now you have to understand, Peter hearing that is going against thousands of years of training that, no, no, wait, you did call those unholy. And I, I distinctly remember those things were forbidden us. So there's a change happening here. And the miracles are important in understanding that very thing. That's why I'm stressing that to you. It's important to understand what's happening here. And then it goes back up. But then the very same thing happens again. It comes back down. Here it comes again. The same net. The same pig. Same lobster. Same vulture. They're all coming down again. The things with the cloven hoofs, they're all, they're coming down again. And it's the same thing. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And I'm sure Peter thought, I thought we've already been through this. Lord, he says again, this happens three times. Lord, I don't eat unclean, unholy things. And the voice says, second time, don't call what I've made unclean or unholy. And it goes up. And it comes back. The, the exact same thing repeated three times. It's given to him. Three times. Peter's used to the word three. The number three. He's heard it before. He knows God's messages sometimes come in trios. For reinforcement. In the same way, in the same way that we sometimes use certain phrases to emphasize things, Jesus often said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, that was meant to emphasize that. Sometimes we get frustrated with people. My wife will get frustrated with me and she will say sometimes, Ralph, Ralph. I, oh, I know I did something wrong there. That wasn't a one-time Ralph, that was a two-time Ralph. Or my mother whenever I did the wrong thing and she wanted to really call me in on that would use my full name. Ralph Richard Walker, you get, oh, I'm dead. I know what that means. She's not proud of the fact that she remembers my middle name. She's telling me I'm dead. Three times he sees the vision, three times. 
And at the end of the third time, as it is going up, Peter was greatly perplexed. The men who had been sent by Cornelius appeared at the gate, having asked directions for Simon's house. And calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. And verse 19, while Peter was reflecting on the vision... The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Now, I, I, I'm going to suggest a couple of things to you about this incident as it happens. These two miracles are performed, do not do not minimize what I'm about to say. This, I think this is vital to understanding miracles in general. These miracles are performed, one for Cornelius, one for Peter, to connect a person who needs to hear a message with an earthen vessel who will give that message to him. And you may say, well, I'm not sure I understand the point. Hey, if Cornelius needed to hear about Jesus, why didn't the angel who came to him just give him the message? The angel would have known that message. And, and why, why was it necessary to convince Peter to go talk to this man when God could have sent any number of ways of that. God could have talked directly to Cornelius. He could have said, Cornelius, let me tell you what I want you to do. God could have preached the same message that Peter preached, couldn't he? And, and probably preached it better. But he doesn't. He doesn't. Why not? Because the intent of this miracle, and I'm going to suggest to you the intent of, I'll say, in, in the expectation that there's one I haven't thought about, the purpose of miracles was to connect messengers of God, earthly messengers of God, with the God who sent them to give them credentials and weight in their message. But God always intended that the messages that would come were going to be delivered by earthen vessels, that is, people with flesh. It is very, very rare for God to deliver messages directly without involving some earthly messenger in the giving of those. So we've got these miracles happening. And then you come to chapter 10, uh, verse 15. The, listen, the voice came a second time. Verse 20, the voice said, get up, go downstairs and accompany them for I've sent them myself. Verse 28, Peter gets there and he says, you know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or visit him. Yet God has shown me I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Verse 31, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said. Verse 39, we are witnesses of all the things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Verse 43, of him the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him should receive forgiveness of sins. And then very quickly when you go to chapter 11 where the story is recounted, uh, Peter took those men who were with him to talk to the circumcised the Jewish brethren in Jerusalem about what he had just done. Peter carries that message. 
Look, the point I'm trying to make is over and over and over again, all of this is get the earthly messenger in. Put the earthly messenger in front of him. Peter is the messenger there. And when they, when they come to chapter 11, how come those Jews in Jerusalem had to listen to Peter? Why didn't God say, hey, I've done this before, drop the net. Why didn't he do that? Why doesn't he do that? Because it all comes down to earthly messengers. And in a world... In a culture where we keep hearing from preachers, you know, listen to God speaking to you. God is talking to you. God told me. God changed this. God spoke. God warned. When you hear those kinds of things, you compare that to the thrust of chapters 10 and 11. Yes, God speaks from heaven. But it's not to deliver the message that is ultimately to be given to Cornelius. It's to prepare everything so Cornelius can hear that message. It's a totally different concept than what I'm hearing from so many religious preachers today. So, those who are waiting for direct messages from heaven, and maybe you're here this morning, maybe you've come here this morning and you said, I've come here to hear what the Lord has to say. I hate to disappoint you if you've been waiting for an angelic messenger or some bombastic, deep, resonating voice of God to speak to you because I believe God is speaking to you today, but it is through this broken, humble, earthen vessel. That's how God talks to us. Through earthen vessels, bearing messages from God. And, and these, this waiting for audible messages or the voice of God to speak to you is expecting something the scriptures do not substantiate, especially in the story that we're looking at right here. So let me, let me offer one more. It's kind of a tangential thought, but I think it does have a bearing here because I have met people who say to me, I have heard from God. I, I remember talking to a guy who said to me, I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a bright light in the room. There was an angel at the foot of my bed and I knew it was an angel because he was hovering. I mean, he was above ground. Gravity had no effect on him. And he talked to me. Now, I, I have two choices in a situation like that. I could say, nope, that doesn't happen. That didn't happen. And I'll, I've lost the opportunity to perhaps have any influence on this person because I've called him a liar or crazy. I think a better course of action is to follow these in this, this course what did he say to you? What did that angel say? Let's not argue about whether there was an angel or not. Who knows? It may be an angel or it might be pepperoni pizza talking late at night. I don't know. But what did it say to you? Because I can deal with that in the Bible. Because if he says, well, he told me I was saved. He, was told, he just said... You're, you're a good man and God recognizes that and you're saved. And now I want you to tell other people about my son, Jesus Christ. I can now go to Galatians chapter 1 where the apostle Paul said, even if an angel from heaven declares to you any message other than that which we have proclaimed, let him be accursed. And in keeping with what I said to you before, that's so important, Paul repeats it. He repeats it right away. As I said, so say I again, if you hear a message or receive a message from someone, even if it be an angel from heaven, if it's different, be accursed. So now, now we can talk about not who the messenger was, but the nature of the message. Because it is the message that is so important. The message, not the messenger. So I'm not afraid with my broken nature 
with my being prone to sin I'm not afraid to still preach the message of Jesus Christ because the message is what's important not the messenger now certainly certainly I can't live a hypocritical life and be defrauding people and and cursing and living in adultery and preach to others that they ought to live righteously but I will say you know the Apostle Paul even said about some who preached for earthly gain in, in whatever the circumstances, if the gospel is preached, that's what matters. Why? Because it's the message that matters. And if you're thinking the message is made powerful or right because a miracle is involved in it, you're missing the point. It isn't the vehicle by which the message came to you. It is the message itself that is vital. Does that make sense? Okay, that made sense to about four of you. I need to start over. I'll do it. I, 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 I think you need to understand that's, that's what Acts 10 and 11 is teaching me. That it's not the messenger and how he came to be there as much as it is the message that he brings in that situation. So, now we come down to this Holy Spirit who highlights the work that is being done by Peter as he's preaching. I'm in verse 44. While Peter was still preaching these words or speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. The Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. So this uh, gift of the Holy Spirit that is poured out, it says in verse 45, the circumcised believers who came with Peter, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Now keep reading with me. Then Peter answered, it says they were hearing him speaking with tongues and exalting God. That's the effect of the pouring out of the Spirit. And Peter answered and said, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Just as we did. That kind of cryptic language there. Um, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the Gentiles in the same manner as it was poured out on the apostles. If you go to chapter 11 and verse 15, Peter in reciting and rehearsing what happened with Cornelius to the Jews in Jerusalem said, the Holy Spirit, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And, and then he says in verse 16, I remembered when this happened, when he, Peter's saying, when I saw this happening to them, I, it triggered something for me. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Okay, I want to suggest a couple of things. It's in the same manner as with the apostles. And what does that mean? With the same manifestation. You remember, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to tell you this uh, receiving this gospel. Even on us at the beginning, what does he mean? At the beginning of what? What is he talking about when he says, as on us at the beginning? Well, let's talk about that Holy Spirit baptism that they received as on us at the beginning what could the beginning mean there are several beginnings that it could mean 
I mean, it could mean at the beginning of our hearing the gospel from Jesus. But that doesn't seem to fit here. It's not the Holy Spirit falling on them when they first met Jesus and heard him or first heard the message from Jesus. And I'll tell you why that doesn't fit. If you go back and look at chapter 11, verse 16, it, he, it, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as he did upon us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, now listen to the wording, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Lord used to say that to them. That was a repeated message for him. He used to be saying, you will be baptized. So if they have already been baptized with the Holy Spirit when they first came to Jesus, that's not a future statement anymore. You get that? It's something that is going to happen to them. And you will find out that it is still future in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, it is still a future event for them. You will be baptized with the Spirit, Jesus says, before he ascends into heaven. So it is something that is going to happen to the apostles down the road from when they first followed Jesus. And how did it manifest itself? In the same way it does with Cornelius. And I think that's the key Peter is giving us. The Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles, you remember, in Acts chapter 2. And how did it manifest itself? In their ability to speak in tongues. The ability to speak in tongues. In Acts chapter 2, they don't immediately go on this tear and start healing everybody. They could have. They had that ability. They will manifest that. But in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell, it manifested itself on their ability to speak in tongues. And, and what was being done there? That people everywhere heard them speaking in the language or native language to which they were born. It, it is God's way of saying these men are doing something no human can do by his own power. It must be the power of God. Therefore, listen to them. They've got my authority much better than a business card that says hey I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ it says so right here the speaking in tongues and later the ability to perform miracles and sometimes even to raise the dead were simply it wasn't the message itself it was verification that the messenger ought to be heard because that message came from God Now, it fell on the apostles, and not in a means of saving them, but it, by the, by the, for the purpose, by the means of heaven, for the purpose of verifying the message that they were going to be presenting. And here with Cornelius, Peter's preaching, and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes on, not on Peter, and the others that are with him, the six men with him, but on the ones that are listening. Why? Again, God is saying, they have my authority. They have my justification. They have my blessing. So that's why Peter says, why, why would we refuse to bring them into the body? God had shown his power and his approval of these people in this household. When I was living in Cleveland, Mississippi, down the road from our house, they set up a tent. And people came through the neighborhood and they were saying, there's going to be a big revival. We'd love to have you come. Would you come? Would you come? And at that, at that time, I thought, you know what? I, I think I will go. I mean, if I were going through this neighborhood trying to tell people, come, we're having some kind of a revival or an effort, I would want people to say, yes, I'll go down there. So I went to the tent and it was a Holy Ghost revival. And the, the main thrust of the message was this. You need to pray to God to receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need to pray about that and we will put hands on you and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And I saw people 
slain in the spirit. You know, I saw men putting hands on the foreheads of people and they were falling over and convulsing. I'm not making fun of that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wanting you to chuckle about that. So I'm not painting it in ridiculous pictures. These people had great conviction about what was happening. But the fact that they had conviction about that and that this incident was repeated again and again and again in that service doesn't mean it was right. Let's talk about Holy Spirit baptism. In comparison to what I saw that evening, Holy Spirit baptism was always a promise, not a command to be obeyed. There's nothing in the scriptures that commands you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nothing. It was a promise of God. It came from him. It was a gift. It wasn't a command or a law ever to be obeyed. So as, that, as I was in that service, and I will, I will tell you this, it got to the point they kept saying, come on down, more of you need to come. You need to come to the front. More people need to receive the Holy Spirit. Pray about that. You have to have the Holy Spirit in order to be saved. And more people came and more people came and more people came. And literally it reached a point where I was the only guy sitting back there where Bob is. I was the only guy left sitting. Every other person was up front. And the preacher kept saying, there are still more to come. I, I kind of had a vague feeling he might be talking about me. <clears throat> so I left. I wasn't going to go down there and humor that. And I thought I, I could outlast him, maybe. But I don't know, he, was, he had a lot of energy. So I left. But I want you to know Holy Spirit baptism was never something commanded. You're, not, you're never commanded to receive the Holy Spirit. It was always a promise of God. Secondly, it was administered by heaven, not through man. What I saw in that service was people laying hands on him to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it was, it was administered from heaven, this baptism of the Holy Spirit poured out on men from God. There were occasions where people received gifts to, to empower, of empowerment to enable them to do the work of God through the laying on of hands. I'm not arguing that wasn't the case. But baptism of the Holy Spirit was not that. Peter doesn't administer that here. That comes from God. And it was manifested in miraculous signs in the speaking of tongues always manifested itself at least in the two occasions and the only two I know of by uh, the ability to speak in tongues and it was not a saving act didn't save them they still had to be baptized I want you to remember again surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did so it wasn't, oh, they got the Holy Spirit, we can all go home, they're saved. That wasn't the case, it didn't save them. The miracles in Acts chapter 10 and recited again in chapter 11 didn't save. They were simply God's fingerprint that this comes from me. So in summary, let me offer this to you. Miracles were a means to an end. They were never meant to be a, an end in themselves. Miracles always lead you to some convicting point. They're not the end point in and of themselves. Secondly, they were not a guarantee of faith or faithfulness. They were never meant to be that. I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, therefore I am God's now and forever. And they were meant, listen, they were meant to confirm the word, not replace the word. In Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 27, This is the story of the rich man Lazarus. And the rich man makes a statement near the end that I, I have been puzzled by and troubled by in my life for a long time. He says about being in torment, look, I don't, I've got brothers and they don't need to be here. He says in verse 27, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. 
God send Abraham who is in or send Lazarus who is in Abraham's bosom. Send him back to warn my family. I have five brothers. Warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. But he said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. That's, that's pretty cryptic language, by the way. Because there is someone who rose from the dead who brought a message. And the majority of the world rejects it. Despite the abundant evidence that the resurrection is not a hoax and not a myth, but a reality. A firm, verifiable resurrection. The world rejects it. So saying, Lord, send an angel to talk to my brother, bring my dad back from the dead to tell us what we need to do, raise somebody up, for a long time I struggled with that. I thought, well, I, I believe I'd pay attention. You know, if my dad came back from the dead and said, do this, son, I, I think I'd probably say, oh, I'm, I'm there. I saw my father coming back from the dead to tell me. But I think what Jesus says is, the message is the important thing, not the messenger. And rather than a uh, here's what I want tool, miracles are a here's what God wants tool. It's what they are, just a tool for what God wants from us. Join me in a final prayer, would you please? Lord, I pray we've been true to the text today. That we have understood the purpose of not only the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but at large miracles. And while we believe all those miracles took place, even as you recorded them and gave them to us, we are willing to embrace and make count in our lives the one great miracle that Jesus died and was buried and was raised on the first day. And we cling to that for our salvation. Because the message, the good news, is Jesus Christ lives, and so can we. We accept that in faith. Please hear us in Jesus' name. Amen.